50 years ago, America's last Apollo astronauts left the moon. In the five decades since Apollo 17, we have built space stations, space shuttles, and space telescopes, and sent probes further than the edge of our solar system. All this time, we humans have remained locked inside low Earth orbit. But today, with the most powerful rocket NASA has ever built, we are on the cusp of thrusting man and woman back out of low Earth orbit and onto the lunar surface once again. This is an inside look at the groundbreaking Artemis program. The rockets, the spacecraft, and the people blazing a new trail to the moon, Mars, and beyond. The first step. The launch. Between Apollo and Artemis, there's a lot of similarities, and some of that's just mostly based on physics. You especially look at the capsules, the same shape, big rockets, things like that. But program-wise, there's a huge difference. We're not just going for flags and footprints. The Artemis program is expanding upon what we did in the Apollo era. We want to go to the lunar surface. We want to build an outpost. We want to live on the moon in order to understand what it will take us to go to Mars. It's a much more deliberate approach to lunar exploration than the Apollo was. In the next decade, NASA envisions the beginnings of a long-term settlement on the moon, one in which a rotating cast of astronauts lives in a modular base camp, mining water and other resources from the moon itself, all while performing the kind of science that will help us in our quest to colonize Mars. So the success of Artemis I for the future of space exploration is really foundational. This planet-hopping journey into the future begins in 2022 with the scheduled launch of Artemis I, the first test flight of NASA's newest, most ambitious rocket yet, the Space Launch System, or SLS. It all starts here. It starts with the transportation system. Tipped with the Orion crew capsule, that transportation system stretches 322 feet from top to bottom and weighs nearly 6 million pounds. The rocket is so massive that NASA had to re-engineer its legendary launch pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center just to accommodate it. 39B was there during Apollo and was the launch site for more than 50 space shuttle missions. But it didn't have the right stuff for Artemis. The launch pad is more than just a concrete platform. It is part of a larger Exploration Ground System, or EGS, where the rocket is assembled, transported, and ultimately launched from. Each of these elements needed a major physical and technological overhaul, beginning with the VAB, or Vehicle Assembly Building. When the vehicle is being stacked we use platforms that basically surround the vehicle so the technicians could do all the testing and all the assembly of the vehicle. There's now 10 levels of platforms that were fabricated and installed just to process the Artemis rocket. Once assembled, the rocket will be coupled to its launcher and chauffeured 4.2 miles to the launch pad atop a newly restored and fortified crawler transporter. The crawler transporter was a piece of equipment that was created back in the Apollo program. The new SLS vehicle weights a lot more than the Apollo vehicle and a lot more than the shuttle. Once the rocket reaches the launch pad, it will be surrounded by three recently installed 600-foot tall lightning towers a technological shield against extreme weather that neither the Apollo missions nor the space shuttles ever had. Below the rocket, a redesigned flame trench is the front line of defense against the SLS's massive burst of energy.
its walls have been covered with 100,000 heat-resistant bricks. And in the middle of this 57-foot-wide, 43-foot-tall trench is the flame deflector, a newly constructed tower of engineered steel plates positioned precisely at a 58-degree angle. Its job, to protect the rocket by deflecting heat and pressure away from the launch pad. If we didn't have a flame deflector, the forces of the flame will go down and come back to the rocket and destroy the rocket. And heat and pressure aren't the only forces that could threaten the rocket. The flame trench is also there to dampen the 176 decibel blast of sound coming from the engines. A 450,000 gallon water tank will begin emptying into the flame trench at a rate of some 1 million gallons per minute seconds before liftoff. It takes a lot of imagination to, to be able to uh, build this kind of stuff. For the Artemis mission, using Apollo's Saturn rockets was never an option. One of the biggest differences between Apollo and Artemis is we're trying to get to the South Pole. Apollo did some fantastic science, but it was all in the equatorial regions of the near side of the moon. And that was where Apollo could get to. Getting to the South Pole takes more fuel, more power, and a mission plan that has never been attempted before. At the south pole of the moon, you have permanently shadowed craters because the sun is very oblique at the bottom. So you get areas where that never see sunlight, where we might find water ice, volatile chemicals. Artemis 1's unmanned 26-day mission will chart a path for future Artemis astronauts. But it is the effort it takes to get off the Earth in those first few minutes of flight that is the reason the SLS is so massive and complex. The SLS rocket is an integrated system of multiple elements that are coming together. We have two boosters. Those are solid rocket boosters. And then we have the core stage, which is a liquid engine stage. And then we have the upper stage. So you actually light everything up, you get all that thrust going, and then you pull the hold down boats off and it jumps off the pads. The two boosters give us over six million pounds of thrust for the first two minutes. And at that point, then it separates from the core stage. And then the core stage then goes on for another six minutes, giving us an additional over two million pounds of thrust. So that gets us into low Earth orbit. From there, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage takes over and delivers Orion into lunar orbit. The engines that will propel Orion toward the moon aren't the only ones built into the rocket. There are also multiple rocket motors built into the launch abort system, which is designed to pull the crew capsule to safety in case of emergency. And the Orion spacecraft itself has one main and eight auxiliary engines. Since this rocket has never flown before, each of these elements had to go through a rigorous test procedure prior to assembly. One of the first was to confirm that the core stage's 500,000 gallon liquid hydrogen tank could withstand the changes in pressure it might experience during a mission. We have hundreds of load cells that we apply onto the hydrogen tank itself, and it twists and turns and stretches the tank. The tank reaches the target pressure as planned, but the team wants to find out just how far they can push it. It's one of our engineers' dreams. They love breaking things. As launch day approaches, NASA tests the engines which will play key roles in getting Artemis to the moon. Two, one, zero. They fire up Orion's launch abort and attitude control motors built into the tip of the rocket. Pirate. 
and Orion's main engine and eight auxiliary engines. Then it's the solid rocket booster's turn. Each of these engines passes its hot fire test. And last but not least, the core stage would finally be anchored into a test stand and ignited. The core stage is the backbone of the SLS rocket. Without the core stage, you wouldn't be able to launch this mission to the lunar surface. Inside the 212 foot tall core stage are the brains of the SLS, its flight computers and avionic systems. At the base of the core stage is its brawn, four RS-25 engines. Six barges worth of cryogenic propellants are loaded into the core stage's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tanks. The countdown begins. Water gushes into the flame trench on cue, and then... The burn is supposed to last 485 seconds, but just over a minute in. TDRA, we did get an MCF on engine four. Look at that, but uh, we're, we're An MCF, a major component failure. And we got a shutdown. The all personnel. Uh, the flight software did exactly what it was supposed to do. It shut the engines down because it detected that we were violating one of our limits. The engineers get to work on the problem and returned to the test stand just two months later. And in this test, the engine successfully burned through more than 700,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, as planned. The core stage was ready for the launch pad. And the team was ecstatic. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a very exciting day. After years of development and testing, the different components of Artemis I are brought together at last at the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. When we're assembling the spacecraft and the rocket and putting it all together, you have to do it very deliberately because in flight, there's an extreme amount of loads. There's a lot of vibration. You have to ensure there's no loose connections that are going to come apart in all of that violent shaking. Assembling the rocket takes months. The power of some 9 million pounds of thrust will be felt on every bolt, every electrical connection, every fuel line in the rocket. That surge of energy will be carried all the way to the top of the SLS in the new Orion space capsule. Atop Artemis 1, Orion is following a trail blazed by the Apollo space capsule. But the similarities between the two only go so far. While Apollo could hold three astronauts for 13 days, Orion can hold four astronauts for up to 21 days. It's 1.5 times larger than Apollo. And unlike its predecessor, which only flew men under six feet tall, Orion is designed for a diverse astronaut corps of men and women. Apollo, right, they were using a very small pool of candidates, small in both physical sense and the numerical sense. For Orion, we actually designed it from a fifth percentile female to a 95th percentile male. We don't have to restrict the size of our astronaut pool um, for the future of exploration. On Artemis I, engineers will be keeping a close eye on Orion's crew. But on this flight, the crew won't be human. So inside Orion on Artemis 1, there's going to be a few human humanoid features. One of them, the Moonikin, as they've been calling him, is a fully outfitted crash test dummy. In addition, a pair of phantom torsos, nicknamed Helga and Zohar, will be on board to evaluate an experimental vest designed to protect astronauts from the elevated radiation levels they may encounter in space. I believe there's over 1,200 sensors 
outfitted on Orion to record things like the uh, temperatures and the vibrations and the loads. There will also be radiation sensors inside the cabin, so we'll be able to measure a bunch of what the crew will experience in the future. With the rocket now standing tall in the vehicle assembly building, the day when it will be transported to the launch pad and ignited draws closer. That day may change the course of human exploration for decades to come. It has already changed the lives of the thousands of people who have worked on it to date. It's a beautiful rocket. I think a lot of people will be looking way up in the sky, looking at how tall this rocket is, and just be completely amazed. Finally seeing Orion on top of the rocket, it's just kind of, wow, we did it. Like, it's all finally come together. There's thousands of people that have been working on this for years, myself included, and to see it all come together finally, it's like a huge validation. It'll be a great day uh, when we see that first Artemis launch, and, uh, and everyone across the whole country needs to have a huge amount of pride not only that day, but also what the future means for, for America. This is America's rocket.